And on today's show, how knowing the history of Social Security may reveal its future solvency. Part one of this week's series on managing Social Security benefits, America's number one retirement plan, with nationally recognized author, platform speaker, and retirement expert, Tom Hagna. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Innsmark, Live Specs, and Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, thanks, Steve. Great to be with you again. Always great to have you back. And Tom, I, your book, I saw your PBS special. It was awesome. And I think if you haven't seen it already, it's still out there. And there's yep. actual UOR addresses on the web. If you Google it, you can go ahead and pick it up and watch the whole thing. Yeah, it'll be on for the next two years oh, running. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Now, when we talk, when I think about Social Security, I generally don't think of Tom Hagna. But you really have reviewed this and really walked through this. And you've even done a little historicity here. Yeah, so there's a lot to be le to learn about Social Security, and it's one of the key steps in my Don't Worry, Retire Happy plan on the, on the public TV special. So let's get into it. Um, okay. The history of Social Security is very interesting. It all started back in 1889 in Germany with Otto von Bismarck. He, he really established the first Social Security plan. It was more of a pay-as-you-go, which is more of a welfare-type program. Mm -hmm. But the retirement age was age 70, but the life, average life expectancy was age 48. It's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> in America, it started in 1935 during the Roosevelt administration, and it was really in response to the Great Depression and the, the longer lifespans that people had, and that in the Great Depression, it was the poor people that really got hurt the mm. most. Um, but the key question at the time, should this be a, the, the dole, like a welfare program, or should it be more like insurance? And that was the big question of the day. Now. Uh, Frances Perkins, who was the Secretary of Labor, and by the way, I don't agree with her politics, but if you want to read uh, uh, an amazing story of a, of a woman with courage, Frances Perkins, how she was able to almost single-handedly get Social Security through uh, the Congress and the Supreme Court because it was unconstitutional. We'll, we'll, we'll get into mm -hmm. all this, but she she more or less wanted a welfare type mm -hmm. program, um, but Roosevelt wanted a insurance program. He did not want a welfare program. He wanted a system to which citizens contribute based on earnings, and he wanted it self-financing. He did not want it to cause any debt or deficit problems. It had to be self-financing. What went in, went out, and that was, that was his plan. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau wanted a pay-for-yourself program, so he agreed with Roosevelt this should be more of an insurance program, not a welfare-type program. Well, the committee under the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, submitted a pay-as-you-go, which is more of a welfare-type program. Well, Roosevelt said, nope, we don't want that. We want pay-for-yourself. We want it to be an insurance program. He told Perkins to modify the proposal because it was the same old dole under a different name. So this is interesting because he's a Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he did not want another welfare program. He wanted self-financing and insurance program. Hmm. Well, the Social Security Act of 1935 passed, and the one that passed was the insurance program that, that Roosevelt wanted, all right? Tax collection started in 1937. Benefits were going to start in 1942. But now the Supreme Court had to weigh in because this was not constitutional. So there's no place in the Constitution mm. for Social Security, all right? Now, taxes could be imposed under the taxing power of the federal government, and payments to the elderly could be justified by the power to promote the general welfare, but they couldn't be linked. So, Steve, here's the deal. You could tax and you can give benefits to the elderly, but you can't tax to give benefits to the elderly. Ah. This was the big dilemma at the time. Well, what the Supreme Court did is they found the program constitutional, but they evaluated all the parts separately. And the approved program was more of a welfare program. It wasn't the insurance program that Roosevelt. So the dilemma at the time was all the people knew that Roosevelt supported this insurance program. They thought they were paying into their own accounts. But it wasn't that way. It was you're going to pay in and your money's going to go to other people. And that's what we have today. Mm. But the government maintained these false accounts for many years just because they, they wanted to, it was political. They wanted to try to let people think that they were contributing to their own. Mm. So August 15, 1935, President Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act and he said, we can never insure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, but we have tried to frame a law which will give some amount of measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-ridden old age. And that is the history of Social Security. Now, here's an interesting thing. The first check went to Ida Mae Fuller. Hmm. Remember, when they set Social Security, Retirement age was 65, life expectancy was 65. Mm -hmm. She took everyone to the cleaners because she lived to be age 100. 
Wow. She had paid in a total of $24.75. Her first check was $22.54, and she collected $22,800 and some dollars off of an initial contribution of $24.75. I'm sorry, that's st staggering money. <laughs> yeah, and wow. I, I can tell you, you're not going to get that kind of rate of return. Oh, no. no. Well, though, when we're talking about the history, now, one of the good things about understanding this history is because you framed it quite well. It is kind of a welfare program now, but the intent was never that. I think FDR has been getting a kind of a poor rap about that because everybody thought he, he was intentionally doing this. Yeah, and you know it's interesting for me because I'm more of a conservative type guy. And but 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 FDR did not want a welfare program. Mm -hmm. He wanted it pay for your pay for yourself. He wanted uh, in a accounts that people would save money in, and then they would get money out. And that's what people thought they had for many many years. And it's just been recently that they found out that this is you know all the money that we put in is already gone. It went to pay for our parents' Social Security, and your Social Security is going to be covered by your kids. We come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit about the future of Social Security and its solvency right after the break. It's not how much money you make for your clients, it's how much money they get to keep, especially in retirement. But retirement income could cause Social Security benefits to be taxed. One tax advantage alternative is life insurance designed as a non-modified endowment contract that can generate tax-free income without taxing Social Security benefits. These contracts offer differing funding options depending upon your client's risk tolerance. For more information on how life insurance can be part of your retirement planning, just email me at steve at downtobusiness.tv. Brought to you by Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. Of course, we're with retirement expert Tom Hanga. Tom, the future. Everybody was like saying, well, you know, this is all well and good, and thanks for the history lesson, but what about the future? Are, are yeah. we going to have, is Social Security going to be solvent? Yes, and I, I'm clear in both my books, Paychecks and Playchecks, and Don't Worry, Retire Happy, that there's plenty of Social Security and that everybody will have Social Security. So the young people think Social Security won't be there, it will be there. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll even show you that Social Security fixing it is a pretty easy fix. Mm -hmm. Medicare and Medicaid, that's another issue mm -hmm. that we could do a whole week of shows on that. But Social Security is mm -hmm. a pretty easy fix. So let's kind of take a look. Um, where do the dollars for the benefits come? 81.9% come from the employer and employee contributions, 15% from interest on the reserves, which we'll talk about in a little while, and 3.1% from income tax on Social Security benefits. And I think you were saying FDR once said it'll never be taxed. Right. I'm just a real quick question. So of all the income for Social Security, 3.1% is only the income tax on people who have to pay taxes on their benefits? Right. So you can I'm see, surprised. yeah, that that's low. You yes. think it would be more? No, but I mean, the majority comes from contributions wow. while they're working. And so here's how it works: um, both the employee and the employer each put in 6.2 percent up to the first 118,500. That's the new rule for 2015. 1.45 percent each uh, for for the Medicare with no cap. Right, with yeah, no, no cap, cap on the right. Medicare. Uh, there's a cap on the on the Social Security. Right. So. A generation contributes to the fund. The fund technically is supposed to earn interest and a generation begins to collect from the fund when it retires, not before, mm -hmm. all right? And you collect taxes from the current working generation. You use them immediately to pay benefits to the current retired generation and the same approach for each subsequent generation. So here, a lot of people think they got an account. I paid into Social Security mm -hmm. for 37 years. Well, that money's gone. That mm -hmm. money was not for you. Your kid's money is for you. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't understand that, all right? And all of this works fine as long as the working population is large in comparison with the retired population or if the working population is growing, they're younger. And it grew with the baby boom as well as the entry of women into the workforce. So while we were growing up, mm. the baby boomers were young, they were growing up, and the, now more women went into the workforce. This worked fine. But here's the problem. The baby boom generation is getting older. This generation is also living longer. And the ratio of workers to retirees is dropping and is expected to continue to drop. In fact, significantly. Look at this. When your parents retired or your grandparents retired, there were 42 workers for every single person on Social Security. Look at how that has dropped to be less than three. It is currently 2.8, and by 2033, there'll be 2.1 workers. Now, Steve, what this slide right here is telling me is one of two things. If this is going to work, we either need more women to have babies, and the, you know the birth rate has gone down significantly. Oh, yeah, or we need some more immigration to have younger people to pay into Social Security. 1983 was the Social Security Amendments. This was Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, Republican and Democrat. They came together. They knew they had to do something. Social Security was in trouble back then. They introduced a gradual increase of the normal retirement age from 65 to 67. I would propose this should continue to increase. 
Every generation. See, my dad got to retire at 65. I get to retire at 67. Is it unreasonable to say my 12-year-old daughter doesn't get to get her Social Security till she's 69? Mm -hmm. Each generation, because they're living longer. Right. Social Security, when it started, retirement age was 65, retirement age was 65. Mm -hmm. It was never set up to pay for 30 or 40 years. They also increased the early retirement penalty and they introduced partial funding in the program. As a result, the program has been okay. Now, it just went into deficit, I think, a, a year or so ago. The, here's one of the main problems. All the money that went in, all the extra money that went into Social Security has been spent. They call it the Social Security Reserves. There's no money in the Social Security Reserves. It's a bunch of IOUs. What Congress did is they went in there and they spent all that money. See, I would maintain that that money should have been invested just like any other pension fund. It should be invested in real estate and stocks and bonds, broadly diversified, let that grow. That could have kicked off a lot of income to either raise benefits or keep it solvent. But that hasn't happened. It's all uh, IOUs. Now they say, you know, it's secure investments backed by the full mm -hmm. face of the U.S. government. Well, that's true. But in order to get that money out, they're going to have to raise taxes or cut spending. The money does not exist. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody thinks Social Security is going to blow up the economy. It's not. Look at this. Social Security was 5% of the GDP. It's only ever going to max out at about 6%. So it's not like Social Security mm -hmm. with the baby boomers is going to blow up. It's not. If you look at what the increase in spending is, Social Security is not the problem. It's Medicare, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Actually, other spending, defense has gone down. It's going to be interest on the debt because we have $18 trillion of debt and Medicare and Medicaid. That is not an easy solution. And you can see this social security does not blow up the budget. All right. It's, it goes up a little, but not, it's not one of these increasing uh, numbers. And so really that's, that's, that's the, the future of social security. I think just a couple things would fix it. Number one, we got to raise the retirement age slowly, mm -hmm. about two years for every generation. Number two, my parents got cost of living increases that look like this. We're not going to get that. Our cost of living is going to be lower and slower. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for the liberals, we've got to raise somebody's taxes. So mm -hmm. now we pay tax up to 118,500. Mm -hmm. Maybe we got to raise that to 125, 30, 40, whatever the numbers are. But I think if we did those three things, we could fix social security for a hundred years. So you like the, th the three pronged approach where it's all sharing the burden. The, yeah, the advancing I, of the age, the taxes on it, the things of that nature. We, we have to be realistic about it. Mm. People are living longer. We've got to mm. raise that retirement age. Cost of living is not going to be that big of a deal because mm. inflation, as you've heard from my economic commentary, is going to be low as far as my eyeballs can see, and interest rates are going to remain low. So I think that's going to happen naturally. But I think, you know, we probably got to raise some taxes in there just to keep, just to get shake hands across the aisle. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. Miss an episode? Just go out to our video archives. And remember, you could be wiser as an educated advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.